talks on psychoanalysis shares topics published in the IPA Society Journals and Congress Debates Worldwide, brought you in the voices of the original authors. We hope this window will allow you to experience the depth and breadth of psychoanalytic thought around the world. This podcast has been created by Gaetano Pellegrini and edited by Gaetano Pellegrini and Andy Cohen. Introduction read by Andy Cohen. In this episode, Marie-Thérèse Badawi presents her paper, Being, Thinking, Creating, When War Attacks the Setting and the Transference Counterattacks. This text, published in 2011 concerning the attack of the psychoanalytical setting in war conditions, has revealed the interest of many psychoanalysts during the COVID-19 pandemic, which also attacks the setting. This questioning tries to find an issue in a situation of war, where the psychoanalysts and their patients are facing the same trauma against the unpredictable, which attacks the invariance of the setting, seems to be a similar problem in these two traumatic states, and even maybe to many others. Marie-Thérèse Badawi is a training analyst of the IPA, member of EPF, SPP, co-founder of the Lebanese Association for the Development of Psychoanalysis, and professor at the St. Joseph University of Beirut. She is author of numerous publications in several languages in the Revue Française du Psychanalyse and the International Journal of Psychoanalysis. She has studied in-depth themes on war, trauma, incest, and female sexuality, and her 1986 book, Le Désir Amputé, is considered by UNESCO as one of the first reliable studies on female sexuality in the Middle East. Being, thinking, creating, when war attacks the setting and the transference counter-attacks. Marie-Thérèse Kerr Badawi In my various encounters with psychoanalysts from other countries, I have always been fascinated by their capacity to make plans for the future. Whenever a colleague suggested that I take part in some project or other, he or she would usually be surprised to hear my reply. We'll see. We'll have to get back to each other on that. My answer was looked upon as an equivocation, since at the start of our discussion, I had been passionately enthusiastic. I then realized that projecting into the future meant something quite different to each of us. For my colleague, time was consistent and governed by the rhythm of predictability, while while I was locked into the unpredictability of a space-time dimension at the mercy of some unexpected traumatic event. War. War may be declared at any time and may indeed be continuous as I have known it to be for 15 and a half years. It is as though war were an ordinary phenomenon, as though we were living in a constant state of trauma on borrowed time of indefinite duration. In this paper, I shall not discuss the clinic aspects of trauma as such, nor those of of temporality. I shall explore how a psychoanalyst can go on working in a context in which the unforeseen reigns. Unexpected events in the outside world often make the analyst's task difficult or even incompatible with the invariants that make psychoanalytic treatment possible. What becomes of the analytical setting when it is subjected to unpredictability? How can the unchanging nature of the setting be protected when it is constantly under attack? What happens when both analyst and analysand are caught up in the same traumatic situation. Here, we have lived through some extreme situations that even today cannot be properly proceeded. 
Any attempt at drawing up an inventory of all the specific instances of attacks against the setting in a war situation would be completely unrealistic. Nonetheless, it is possible and feasible to base such a, a study on situations that have been experienced in actual reality. Emile, Paul are patients with whom I experienced out of the ordinary situations brought about by war, situation to which some response had to be made. And at once, in the immediacy of a reality that could not wait. Emil, sitting in my psychoanalyst's armchair, I can hear the bombs pounding in the distance. Emil is talking to me about his father, his mother, his fantasy world. The noise of the bombs is coming closer. Like all of my compatriots, I recognize the three successive phases of the noise, the noise that they make. First phase, the noise when they are fired, also known as départ, that gradually approaches. Second phase, the whistling sound they make as they was uh, uh, as they pass nearby. And third phase, the echo of their disintegration when they hit their target, also known as arrivée, as they explode closer and closer. I feel afraid for Emile, for myself, for my family. I'm thinking about some of my relatives who are probably driving along some road or other. I'm afraid for them. Emile is talking to me about his fantasy world. I hear shells explode, their fragments striking the walls of the building just next door, an indication that the bombs are falling closer and closer. I'll have to make a phone call just to be sure that my family are safe, forgetting that even phones were not functioning at that time. Emil is talking to me about his fantasy world. I hear people shouting in the entrance hall of my building. I hear footsteps as my neighbors rush headlong down the staircase toward, towards the shelter. Perhaps we should go there too. I hear Emil saying, nothing can happen to me because you're here with me. And he tells me about his fantasy world. I'm not, I'm not listening to him anymore. Farewell, evenly suspended attention, benevolent neutrality, active matrix, transformation processes. Henceforth, nothing is of any importance to me other than reality and my responsibility. What should I do with Emil? Send him out into the street? That would be my way of ignoring external reality and experience this folie à deux, which is no longer mine, which henceforth is only a one-person folie hallucinating the presence of another person who is no longer present. Emile is talking to me about his fantasy world. I was no longer present. I had been caught up in my perception of reality, a traumatic reality, the one that Emile was at that very point denying. He was caught up in the internal representations that splint him off from perceiving that external reality. He was carried away by, by his idealizing transference onto an omnipotent analyst, the protecting and containing mother, keeping him safe, that I was for him in the continuity of his own world, even though I was no longer able to sustain that role. He was caught up in a transverse neurosis that was dominated by a few delusional aspects, the least 
of which was the almost psychotic refusal to integrate any reality elements, as Michel Nero would have said. He was carried away by a kind of hallucination brought about the regression. Fortunately, this was quickly halted as soon as he faced up the reality testing that took place once the session was over. But not before that point. We had to wait 45 minutes, 45 long minutes, until Emile's ego came out of the hallucinatory world of dreams and fantasy and at last managed to differentiate between hallucinating and perceiving. One external reality came to the fore with all of its sensoriality. He was then able to hear the bombs. He heard them, but he was not afraid because, as he kept on saying, I was present and protecting him. Although there was no longer any denial of reality, the end of the session brought him face to face with all the sensorial aspect of perceiving an obvious danger, the idealizing transference was still functioning as a screen, as a defensive maneuver set up by his ego, overwhelmed as it was by a kind of reality that was difficult to metabolize. The transference illusion functioned as a protective shield between a meal and a deadly reality. The interrelation was a protective shield against what was overwhelming him and an interpsychic level. I settled him down in my waiting room, well protected by the internal walls, at the very heart of my consulting room. I had to give him some water, sandwiches, a radio set so that he could keep up to, up to date with the news, and later, a mattress so that, that he could spend the night there. These being survival kits, obviously. It was only the following morning that Emile was able to leave. Paul. There has been no sessions for a whole fortnight now. There has been no let up in the bombing for the past two weeks, intensive bombings with no interruption. One of the characteristic features of the war in the country was that it was forever changing its identity, it was discontinuous, and it moved from region to region. But now it is continuous. All regions are being targeted. So Paul has not been able to come to his sessions for a whole fortnight and he was going through a very fragile phase. I'm at home in my dressing gown. It is nine o'clock in the morning. The doorbell rings. I open the front door. I see Paul standing in the doorway. His complexion is shallow, his face almost white. I cannot stop the look of surprise that comes over me. He says that he absolutely needs to talk to me. I think of the setting, of its constancy, of its unvarying spatial and temporal aspects. But I'm thinking also of the fact that Paul is in distress and that he is suffering. How can one emphasize yet, still remaining a psychoanalyst, empathy, is necessary, but thinking is essential. Thinking as a psychoanalyst, said André Green in La Pensée Clinique. I must listen to what he has to say, but where? The floor of my study has mattress all over it. Some family members have come over to stay because my house is situated in an area that is less likely to be shelled. They are all here chatting away. I'm in my dressing gown, my hair not even brushed. 
I ask Paul to wait a moment or two. Then I'll come back and let him in. I dash into the study, put the mattress into an adjoining room, get the furniture back in place, put away the photos of my children, tell everybody to be absolutely quiet, get dressed in a hurry and brush my hair. All that takes me a couple of minutes. I go back out to fetch Paul. He is standing exactly as I left him, as though petrified. I tell him to come in. As soon as he sits down, he starts talking, talking to me. He looks at me as if I were the only thing in the whole world that counted for him. As if nothing had changed. The address, the space, the world, the time, the entire setting, nothing. External reality no longer existed. Nothing existed except me. Me as an object of cathexis of everything that is maternal, paternal, protective. Although there had been some enactment, As regards the external spatial setting, nothing had changed with respect to the internal continuity that I could offer him via the extended kind of handling that stretched from my consulting room 15 kilometers away, but enrichable, to my home, the only place that he could reach and into which I could take him. I had the feeling that I was the one who was maintaining the setting. More than that, I felt that I was the setting. The protective matrix was both me and what I was making of the link link between us. What I was making of our encounter, a psychoanalytic relationship, what I was making of the interrelation of analytical communication in that encounter between me, the analyst, and him, the analysant, without any confusion between transferent cathexis and me as a person. In his book on Freud's sayings, Alain de Missola mentions Freud's reply when Blanton asked him if he had been able to go on working once the Nazis had invaded Austria. Freud answered, no, when consciousness is disrupted, it's impossible to show any interest in the unconscious. That is what happened to me when I was with Emile. I was no longer interested in his unconscious. I was, no listi- I was not listening to him anymore. I was caught up in some external issue that prevented me from listening to him. I was afraid for him, for myself, for my relatives who were out driving somewhere. When trauma is a part of the actual reality of both analyst and analysant, how can transformations be brought about? What becomes of the analyst's role? No attentive listening, no interpretations, no transformations, just a presence while the session lasts when suddenly outside war attacks the setting. But by being there, respecting his splitting, the transference neurosis, and the hallucinatory aspects within the session expressed more powerfully than the external traumatic dimension that might have prevented him from going on with the session, I was able to offer Emil a space that formed a protective shield and to contain within the setting the unfolding of his intrapsychic conflict. I was, as though in spite of everything, I could still cathect his mental functioning thanks to a counter-transference shield between him and the outside world. I'm talking here, of course, 
only of that se- of the- only of that session when the wall burst in upon an already existing setting and a process that was already ongoing. But if war is there from the very beginning and is continuous, would it ever be possible to establish a setting and cathet the psychoanalytic relationship? In my view, that would make nonsense of the analyst as a person, turning him or her into an all-powerful character split off in omnipotence, as, as if the analyst could be in some kind of control of an unpredictable setting, a mindless superman figure in a denial or external reality and of his or her own psychic reality. In Paul's case, the setting was no longer the usual one, when the setting becomes inaccessible because of the traumatic impact of war, the transference neurosis appears to restructure it by making its spatial and temporal materiality disappear. This is transposed onto the analyst who is no longer the guardian of the objective setting, but actually becomes that setting wherever the analyst happens to be. It is the articulation of the transference-counter-transference relationship that structures the situation. What will the analyst do with with the transfer neurosis, with this link between him or herself and the analyzant, with the encounter that, in the case which I'm describing, becomes impossible in the initial setting. For Paul, the imminence of that encounter was a real need. By understanding Paul's wish to see me as a need, according to Winnicott, the need to protect himself against being overwhelmed on the level of his psychic economy, by offering him the kind of handling typical of a mother devoted to her infant and by agreeing not to limit myself to the space and time of a constricted setting which was anyway inaccessible, I gave precedence to the encounter itself, to the analytical bond, to the psychoanalytic relationship, the subjectivation of that bond undestructible. I agree with André Green and Paul Denis when they argue that this is not simply a question of intersubjectivity. There is an articulation between two specific psychic tendencies and their related processing. Psychoanalytic treatment is not an interaction. It is the analysis of an interaction. This is what I call an interrelation. The analyst catexis of the analyst and mental functioning, the understanding of the transference neurosis as a transference catexis of what the analyst represents and not the person he is, together act as a protective shield with respect to the danger of being overwhelmed when destructiveness, in the present case war, is everywhere and when unbinding of the drives becomes likely. In wartime, in the cases that I was I have presented, attacks against the setting represent a work of the negative that remains peripheral. It does not nullify the interrelation, which remains protected and cathected by both analyst and analyzant. That interrelation is like an islet, an opening for the wish to stay alive when the analyst remains in the role of analyst while enlarging the setting to the extent of representing it him or herself. 
If, however, the analyst does not stay within the boundaries of that role, when he or she is driven towards manic enactments in order to vanquish the death drive, the negative dimension is no longer peripheral and will start to attack. No analyst, no analysant, no setting, no superego, no prohibitions. None of this exists anymore. Only unbound drives remain with their work of disorganization and destruction. In my view, this might explain, at least in part, why various kinds of transgression have occurred in times of war. Some analysts have had to deal with the devastating drive impulses that have led them to sabotage the analytical setting, being their, themselves their only reference in the direction of their work in isolation, faced with wave after wave of negative aspects attacking them from all sides, they felt themselves to be like gods, allowing themselves all sorts of illicit maneuvers, like supreme beings, all-powerful, deciding purely by themselves what they could do. Similarly, the war situation, where impunity is the norm, may well have fed into a pre-existing perverse way of operating in some analysts. They employed the low, they exploited the lawlessness that ran at the time with no limit to its expansion and no repression to hold it in check. Laws no longer existed, so they become the law. War did not create morbidity, but in, it enabled it to be expressed. It gave expression to a pathological state already present. In the work of the negative, André Green writes, the work of the negative will concern itself with the relation to the object caught in the crossfire of the destructive drives on the one hand and the life or love drives on the other. The work of the negative, thus, comes down to one question. How, faced with the destruction which threatens everything, can a way be found for desire to live and love? I would tend to answer that question as follows. In times of war, through the interrelation between analyst and analysant, with the analyst remaining in the role of analyst. This is an object-related dimension of love and of life as against the drive impulses of destructiveness and death. There remains for the analyst some real analytical world, processing the mental trauma with its echoes in the trauma of the surrounding culture because bombs that explode as metaphors for drive-related phenomena repeatedly wound and destroy. That is when the psychoanalytic setting can come to the fore. I can, it can help to find some way of breaking free of that incessant repetition by reactualizing fragments of the trauma the resurgence of drive-related phenomena that return and become part of the present. The analytical situation is then cathed as a solution, as a loop in the trauma through which it can be proceeded. When destructiveness is everywhere and we are faced with unpredictability, it's no longer a matter of holding on to the immuability of the setting. It is no longer a matter of developing a thick skin in order to dominate counter-transference, as Freud said in his letter to Jung in June 7, 1909. It's no longer a matter of emotional coldness, 
as he also advised doctors in 1912. It's no longer a matter of interpreting and transforming. What is important is to be present, present as a psychoanalyst and remain as one. Remain as one and create. Create while thinking, thinking clinically. Thank you.